Well, hello there. And it's great to be back at my alma mater, Leiden University. It's great to see so many enthusiastic faces in the audience. And I must say, you really look nice as well. Actually, I made a little bit of an effort myself this morning. This is one of my favorite suits. I wear it on special occasions. I like to step talk, of course. Because let's face it, we all care about what we wear, right? We want to look nice, we want to feel good, we want to be comfortable. And for me, until recently, those were pretty much the only things that I thought about when I bought my clothes. But there's more to it. There's more for us to care about. And that's something I'm learning more and more about every day. But first, let me get back to this great university. When I look back at my time here, I think the most important thing that I learned here is to, to challenge what I saw, to think beyond it, to look through a new lens, if you will. And 25 years ago, when I graduated here, I started working in international business. And as the years passed and as I challenged what I saw, I shifted my focus to the role of the private sector in the lives of people in developing countries. And I moved from business to international development and ultimately now started last year as the director of Fairware Foundation. And along my journey, I started to realize something important. In business, we often talk about goods and services and business models and demand and supply. But in the end, every single element of economics and business is about people. So when I told you that today I'd be talking about how important it is that you care about what you wear, the story really isn't about clothes. The story is about people. Now, you may have heard the term global supply chain. And this is an example of a global supply chain. This is the fashion supply chain. It looks pretty complex, right? Actually, our clothes go through a lot of steps before they reach us. The global supply chain is really complex, but what you probably don't realize is that this suit or, or that that you're wearing is actually uh, not made by machines and automated assembly lines. It's made by human beings. It's cut and sewn and assembled manually, one by one. It's actually pretty old fashioned. So what this term global supply chain hides is an important truth. It's the fact that it's a human chain. It's a human chain that connects us through our clothes to millions of people with scissors and sewing machines in developing countries. So that's what I meant when I said there's more for us to care about. Now, you may know that um, many of our clothes are produced in Bangladesh. Having been at a lot of incredible people, and I've also uh, heard some startling stories from the factories. Now let me try to sketch you a typical uh, life of a factory worker in Bangladesh based on uh, what my colleagues and I see every day in the factories. Let's say this is Nazma. Nazma is working in a factory that produces clothes for uh, brands in the US, brands in Europe, brands that you probably know about. Maybe you own even some of their products. Nazma is 24 years old. She works as a senior sewing machine operator. She earns about 100 euros a month on her basic salary. She's married, she has three children, and she's been working in this factory since she was 14. Now, you may think that 14 is a very young age to start, and I agree. Uh, but actually, in Bangladesh, it's not only completely legal, it's also pretty common. And you may think that 100 euros in basic salary after 10 years is not very much. And it isn't, because it's really not enough to make ends meet. But actually, it's well above the legal minimum wage in Bangladesh. Okay, Nazma has a normal working week of 48 hours, 
six days a week. That's her normal working week. But a real work week looks more like 70 or 80 hours. Can you imagine a 70 or an 80 hour work week? She hardly sees her children. She is often harassed at work and traveling home in the dark, as you can imagine, is a daily challenge. Yet you will never or hardly ever hear a factory worker complain. In fact, when I was in Bangladesh and I asked the women about their work, I was shocked at some of the answers. First, they said that they were lucky to have a decent job at all because they have little or no formal education, which isn't really surprising if you start at 14 in a factory, right? And the other thing they said is that they were so happy that this factory offered them the overtime. They were so happy that they could have the 70 or the 80 hour work week. And why? Well, because their basic salary just didn't pay enough. They needed the extra pay from the overtime. Probably the only thing that Nazma would complain about is if her workstation, her sewing machine, were too far away from the toilets. Because that would mean that only during the lunch break she could go to the bathroom. Otherwise she'd fall behind too much on the work and get scolded by her supervisor and probably have her wages cut as well. Because this is the harsh reality. The money that Nazma and her husband are making is not enough to provide for more than basic food and shelter and a commute to work. There is no buffer for if someone falls ill or if repairs are needed. And it probably also means that they will have to send off their children to work at a very early age as well. It's a vicious cycle because the children can't go to school to make more of their lives. And there's not much hope for change. And here at this university, I find it deeply unfair that there are still so many people in emerging economies who still can't invest in a better future for their children. Now in development, we look at what a family needs to make a decent basic living. And we call this a living wage. And a living wage for someone like Nazma is probably around 170 euros basic pay. Now, for you, maybe the, the difference between 100 euros per month and 170 euros per month, maybe that's not so much. But for her, it's a world of difference. Earning a living wage makes all the difference. Now, who do you think would have the most influence on Nazma's life? You think that's Nazma herself? Or maybe her husband? Is it her line supervisor or the factory management? Is it the government of Bangladesh, perhaps? Or would it be the brand that ordered the clothes that she's making? Well, if you thought the last option, you're right. The direct influence of a brand on the life of the workers in the supply chain is huge. And it's also very little known, even to the people working in the brands. But let me give you an example. If an order is placed late, workers are pressured to work even faster, even longer hours, even less time for that bathroom break. You know, brands make important decisions. They choose where they produce their clothes. And those are usually countries with inadequate laws and weak labor inspections. But that's their choice to produce there. And brands choose what pressure they put on the factory and on the workers. And brands choose how they negotiate the prices they pay. Do they leave enough room for a decent or even a living wage? Do they even think about that when they decide what they want to pay? Well, sadly, most brands don't. They just pay the lowest possible price. But brands make the decisions. Brands have the influence. So brands should take the responsibility for the basic well-being of the workers in their supply chains. I have another question for you guys. Who has the most influence on the brands? Can you guess? It's us. We do. <laughs> yes, as consumers and as Investors, we are more powerful than any big brand CEO. And I must say, I felt good when I bought this suit supply suit. 
because being a fairware member company means that they have an independent organization working with them to improve the labor condition in their supply chain. So for fairware to spread and for people like Nazma to get a decent wage, we need to start caring about more than just a look and feel when we buy our clothes. In fact, that's what we did with food, isn't it? Since about 10 years or so, consumers have become more and more conscious about what they put into their bodies. And more and more, the food that we buy is grown responsibly. And this has had a huge influence on the way our supermarkets do business. Now it's time to pay the same amount of attention to what we put onto our bodies. It's time to make sure that what we, what we wear is fair. So, what can we do? Well, first we need to understand where we are in this global supply chain. And I've, I've brought it back a little bit more simple here. We already saw Nazma, right? She's here in the factory. And where are we? We're, we are all the way on the right. We're the consumer. And the interesting thing is, it's a very good position. Because we are paying for everything that's happening in that supply chain. We're paying for it. So it's a pretty powerful position. And it also comes with some responsibility. Next thing I want you to understand is how little of what we pay actually goes to the worker. Let me take this example, 29 euro t-shirt that you might find in the high street here. Only 18 cents out of the 29 euros that you pay go to the workers in the factory. There's not even near 1%. 18 cents. So what I want you to remember here is that actually, financially, there is room for what we wear to be fair. Now you might think there is an easy solution. I just buy more expensive brands, right? Well, wrong. Or at least partly wrong. Of course, those rock-bottom prices, those very, very low prices with the fast-changing collections that you see in some of those shops are just too low to allow for a decent wage. That's, that's true. But surprisingly, in fashion, being a more expensive brand doesn't necessarily mean being a fairer brand. In fact, a t-shirt made for a luxury brand and a t-shirt made for a discounter may well be produced in the very same factory by the very same underpaid workers. So as consumers, we can keep our fingers crossed and hope that the brands we like, the brands we choose, our brands are making the responsible choices. But that's not how a supply chain works. In a supply chain, ultimately, we decide what happens. We pay, we decide. So the good news is that it's possible to make and to sell fashion that's fair for all. And with the help of responsible brands and consumers like you, we're making a push for a new normal in the industry. And meanwhile, what can you do? Well, you can start caring and start showing that you care through your actions. You can choose brands that have clear, independently verified social policies. And in shops, ask about the brands. Ask about how the workers are treated. Because if you care, the shopkeeper will care. And if the shopkeeper cares, the brand will care. And speak out for labor rights, for the rights of people like Nazma. Share what you wear online using the hashtag who made my clothes, for example. And of course, yes, avoid those prices that are just too good to be true or at least too cheap to be fair. Supply chains are ultimately about people. People like Nazma who make our clothes, and people like you and me who buy them, and people in the brands who make the important choices. Because it really is a matter of choice, as fairware brands show every day. So together, let's make fashion fair. Let's care about the workers who make our clothes. And let's care about what we wear. Thank you.